Welcome to Technovation. I'm your host, Peter High. My guest today is Cal Newport, the best-selling author and computer science professor at Georgetown University. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Well, Cal Newport, welcome. It's great to see you. Great to speak with you. I really appreciate you making time um, for as by way of introduction. Cal is an associate professor of computer science at Georgetown University. Uh, his scholarship focuses on the theory of distributed systems. And his general audience writing explores the intersections of culture and technology. One of the things I've always admired about his work is the extent to which he can span across such, such a broad uh, catalog of topics. Uh, he's the author of seven books, including most recently Deep Work, uh, Digital Minimalism, and A World Without Email. Uh, each are terrific and run counter to a lot of what is inherited wisdom in this day and age and, and really test one's thinking about um, how to organize your life, among a variety of other topics that no doubt we'll get into through this conversation. He's also a contributor to The New Yorker, and he has a terrific podcast called Deep Questions. Uh, Cal, welcome to Technovation. Great to speak with you today. Well, Peter, thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this conversation. I have as well. And, and by the way, the irony of working with the author of A World Without Email over email to schedule this was not lost on me. So thank you for answering my emails and making time for the discussion. Well, my, my life is just redolent with ironies, <laughs> email, <laughs> like social media, YouTube. It's I'm a, I'm a techno critic in a technological world. So what are you going to do? Exactly. Exactly. Again, a topic I'm looking forward to delving more deeply into, but I wanted to begin. Um, it was fascinating for me to delve further into your work, rereading a couple of your books, uh, going into a catalog of your writing uh, and, and learning a little bit more about your journey to become who you are. And one of the things that I was really fascinated about was um, that as I delve further back, uh, some of the surprise that to me was that the, the role that comedy and comedy writing have played uh, as an inspiration to you in terms of the writing you do even today. Uh, you've talked about the importance of uh, your wisdom you've gained from Steve Martin and his uh, fantastic autobiography, Born Standing Up. Uh, be so good they can't ignore you. You mentioned that as being a key insight. You've talked about your appreciation for the uh, the humorous Dave Barry, a Pulitzer Prize winner. Uh, but I wonder if you could take a moment and talk a bit about your experience uh, at the Jack O' Lantern. That's the um, you went to Dartmouth as an undergraduate, and that's the the comedy periodical publication at Dartmouth. And you've talked about how that was really a seminal experience for you in many ways that got you down the path towards becoming a published book author as well. Could you could you talk a little bit about that experience, please? Of course. Yeah, the, the venerable jack-o'-lantern, uh, been around for a long time, uh, home to Theodore Geisel, better known as Dr. Seuss, did cartoons for the jack-o'-lantern. Buck Henry, uh, writer of The Graduate and the Saturday Night Live host, he was a, a jack-o'-lantern writer. So there's this long tradition in Ivy League schools of these humor societies and it is a lesser known fact about me that I, I was the editor of the, the Dartmouth Jack-O-Lantern. The key thing there, I think the key thing I learned from that is that comedy writing is essentially taking what stand-up comedians would do verbally and trying to translate it into words in the sense that rhythm and timing is everything. So we know this, we recognize this with stand-up comedy that every beat makes a difference. The word choice makes a difference. Uh, it's all about how you actually deliver the information. Comedy writing just does the same thing with word choice and punctuation and grammar. So if you get serious about doing it, and so I spent a few years doing this pretty seriously, you really learn to see the language as a toolkit of different tonalities and timings and spacings and that you want to pull back and deliver. You want to build up your rhythm and then pause. And that's been really useful for the whole rest of my writing career. When I'm writing things that aren't funny at all, or at least they're not meant to be funny. I think a world without email is maybe taken as a comedic <laughs> claim by a lot of knowledge workers, but unintentionally funny. Having an appreciation that language is something in the written language, you have to really care about how it sounds and the rhythms and the pacing and the, and the word choice. That served me very well. It certainly served me very well when I began writing for The New Yorker is that that's an outlet that really does care about tonality and really cares about rhythm of prose and, and how the language actually sounds. And, and so that was a happenstance. I like mm. comedy, but by liking comedy, I ended up actually building up a new toolkit that helped unrelated writing. And what's remarkable is it was while you were at Dartmouth, I believe you were 20 when you got your first book contract. And they say you should write about what you know. You certainly did that. Your first three books, uh, How to Win at College, How to Become a Straight A Student, How to Be a High School Superstar, 
the first two of those, at least the contracts came while you were in college, I believe, if I recall the, cr the chronology correctly, that your second one may have been written between college and, and uh, grad school, but nevertheless, uh, very, very early, quite precocious. Um, you've talked a bit about uh, the, the, the role that uh, a connection, a family connection, who was a book agent, interestingly enough, a fiction book agent played in helping you along the way. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. And then I'd love to get into the substance eventually of, of those, those uh, first three books. Well, because I was, I was writing a lot in college. So I was doing the humor writing uh, for a while, I had a column at the newspaper. So I was doing a lot of writing in college and I, I got the idea in my junior year that I wanted to write a book and I was essentially dared into this by an entrepreneur friend of mine. I had come out of the world of entrepreneurship. I had had my own small startup in the late 90s, early 2000s during the first dot-com boom. So I was plugged into that world. And so that gave me this entrepreneurial sense of things are possible. Things are possible for young people that maybe a generation before we would say, uh, you got to wait till you're older. So there's this sense of expansive possibility that I think permeated the atmosphere in the, the late 90s going to the early 2000s. And so an entrepreneurial friend of mine had heard some idea I had for a book. And so just write, if you're gonna write a book, write a book, how hard can it be? Because I had that entrepreneurial background, however, I was tuned towards evidence-based goal pursuit. You wanted to whatever, double your sales in a traditional business, you would go study uh, what matters for sales? Let me read a book about sales. Let me talk to someone who doubled their sales and try to find out what happened. You're very used to that in the world of business. I brought that over to writing. I said, okay, well, let me talk to someone who actually knows how the world works. And that was the family connection. It was a friend of my uncle's. My uncle was a journalist and, and she was a, a fiction agent. And I said, could I talk to you about book writing? And it was critical, I think, that she was a fiction agent. So there was no worry that I was just sort of secretly trying to picture my idea. You know, it's, it's a, if you're a book agent, people, everyone you know is always saying, you know, I've got this idea for a book. So there's no worry about that. So she could just open up. And I said, here's the thing. I'm 20. Uh, I want to write a book. I want to do it now. I'm impatient. How could I possibly make that happen? And why this conversation was so useful is that she was very honest. Like, well, this is very hard. Most publishers do not want to give money to a 20-year-old or a 21-year-old. Uh, you have a very narrow path that probably exist if you want to sign a book contract now before you're even a senior at college. And I said, well, teach me, you know, I want to know what's, what, what would really work here? Not what I want to work. I don't want to have my own story. I tell myself about, well, if I just write every day, I'll have this brilliant book and I'll be the next Malcolm Gladwell tomorrow. I said, what could I do? And she gave me the advice that mattered. It's got to be uh, something that matches your unique experience. So you're a student. So writing about student stuff would work. She said, you need to do a lot of the writing for the book ahead of time. I would suggest writing articles on the topic of the book. Um, and you want to really have worked out exactly what you're going to say, much more so than a later stage fiction, nonfiction writer would, because they're just not going to trust you. They're not going to know that if the idea is going to be good, can you write? And I just took her advice to heart. I went and got a bunch of contracts for these third rate, I would say, student oriented, typically online or, or weird print run magazines aimed at students got a bunch of commissions, uh, got a lot of bylines, used some of those bylines to actually do all of the research I would need for my first book. So for an article where I needed to interview two people, I'd interview 50 so they could be the foundation for my book. And then when I pitched uh, agencies, because you, know, you start with agencies, not with, with uh, publishers, I had the exact right story to tell. I'm a, a writer. I'm in college. I want to write about college. You need a college student to do this, but you need a college student who knows how to write. And I do. And here's my idea. And I've already done the research for it. And here's five writing samples. And here's an annotated table of contents. And here's seven sample chapters. So I'm the right person to write this. The idea is right. And I know how to write. And I had the package all together. And so things move pretty quick from there. Yeah, really interesting and great advice for somebody who's 20 or 60 uh, uh, if they, they want to write a book in terms of the pathway to to doing so. I mentioned you wrote about what you knew. You uh, that, that first book was How to Win at College. Uh, the second would be How to Become a Straight-A Student uh, and then How to Be a High School Superstar. Clearly, uh, you, those were each things you, li you lived. You went to Dartmouth. Clearly, you were a high school superstar. You, your grad work was done at MIT, so you, you won at college and were a straight-A student. So uh, these were, were topics you knew quite well and could give advice on. And, and I wonder, uh, especially as you went through three books on this, what, was there a pathway you envisioned potentially of continuing to be sort of uh, sort of uh, to, to be this advisor to young people 
Uh, or was this always sort of a means to an end in terms of developing the type of reputation that would allow you to expand beyond the swim lane you were you were establishing for yourself? I made that pivot a little bit later in the process of writing those three books. I think at first my focus was become a better writer. So, so certainly for the first two books, that was the case. And, and the way I did that actually was with the structure of the books themselves. So my, my first book, How to Win at College, structurally was simple. It was 75 rules. Each rule had a contrarian title, right? Don't do all your reading. And then, I don't know, two or three pages, right? So maybe uh, 800 words of explanation of that rule. I did that structure on purpose because it's easier to write. You know, I, it's, it's individual rules. Each has a contrarian idea. Come up with a couple examples. You could write one per day. My next book, How to Become a Straight A Student, I said, okay, I got to get better. So now I'm going to go to a traditional chapter structure, long chapters with multiple ideas broken up into section heads. I wasn't confident doing that with my first book. Uh, I was with the second. And it was between the second and the third that I really made the decision that long term, I want to write general nonfiction idea books, books that can have an impact on the culture as a, uh, as a whole, the type of books I would buy from the bookstore. And, and that's when I began thinking, okay, how do I make that pivot? And the third book was designed with that in mind. So, so it's, it's a quirky book. It's called How to Become a High School Superstar. Uh, the original title pitch was actually called The Zen Valedictorian, and it was going to cover from high school through graduate school. And it was taking a contrarian look at success academically, stress, how to avoid stress, to build a meaningful but sustainable academic career. And I wrote that book on purpose, like a Malcolm Gladwell book. So now I'd really pushed the complexity of the writing from 75 two-page rules to by the time I got to that third book, I was basically auditioning for general nonfiction. I was getting into the, the psychology of impressiveness and what we can learn from counter-signaling theory from biology to understand what looks impressive on a college application. I was doing original reporting of case studies of these students who were had done very well in college admissions, but were really relaxed and trying to understand what made them tick. And so it was really, that was a, let's really push my skills to where they need to be to leave writing student advice books. And the next book after that was my, my first general audience book. Also in between my second and third book, I started doing a lot of uh, freelance writing. And I, I was working in particular for an online magazine at that point that's not, not around anymore, but it was called Flack Magazine, sort of like a early 2000s hipster online or M plus one McSweeney's type magazine. And that entire experience for me was about chops, taking on writing commissions that were sort of straight up uh, semi-literary narr narrative nonfiction where it was for editing and they would reject a piece if it wasn't good, where I could just work, uh, get my reps in trying to write a more sophisticated brand of nonfiction. So there was this, this long period where I basically started training for becoming a general nonfiction writer because I wasn't coming out of journalism and I wasn't writing about my academic field. So I'm not a historian who then wanted to write biographies about historical figures. And so that training leading up to and including my third book was a conscious pivot uh, and that pivoted me into the world of, of hardcover original general nonfiction. Very interesting. I want to move backwards in the chronology to mention something you already uh, captured and that is at 17, you started a dot-com company called, I think it was Princeton Web Solutions. You, you were uh, based in Princeton, you went to high school in Princeton. Um, and it's about the same time that Facebook was founded. So by the time you arrived at Dartmouth, uh, around that time, Facebook reared its head there. Uh, so you would certainly have had some experience, perhaps, uh, or, or knowledge of its immersion. Um, uh, and you had, so you had experience in entrepreneurship. You elected to study computer science, and you were generally an internet enthusiast. Uh, so it would seem rather ironic, again, we get back to the irony, uh, to some at least, that you elected fairly early on not to participate in social media. And I wonder if you can explain your rationale even then as to why that would be the case. It must, it must have, I can, I can only imagine among your cohort, it must have been a very unusual stance to take. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting about it is, is Zuckerberg is part of my cohort. We were yeah. both uh, Ivy League computer science students at the same time. And we both had companies. His did a little better. <laughs> if we're going to be, I mean, look, here's what I'll say between Mark Zuckerberg and me, our companies have a market cap that was as big as $800 billion. So we can, <laughs> between the two of us, we really generated a lot of market impact. Um, 
the internet enthusiasm actually is, is it's not ironic as much as it is explanatory. I think this was really common among early internet enthusiasts that they looked askance when social media came along. Like, because we had been involved in this since the mid-90s. We emerged, we saw the emergence of the consumer web, early internet enthusiasts. We 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 remember Telnet and Gopher and Usenet news groups and the original BBNs and the MUDs and the early HTML and hand-coded pages. And, and a lot of what we were enthusiastic about about the internet was actually contrary to what was happening with these companies like Facebook. So, so the, the context of the time was that Web 2.0 emerged in the early 2000s. It emerged, in, in essence, in response to the original dot-com crash, which happened in uh, late 2000, early 2001. And Web 2.0 was a, a, a collection of technologies that made it easier for people to publish information on the public web and JavaScript-based technologies like Ajax, et cetera. But basically it made it easy for you to have things like blogs or, or websites where I could, I could update and write posts and embed images without having to go into HTML and work in Emacs and upload files through FTP servers. So it made the internet more interactive. You could post information uh, more easily. And, and so it unleashed this sort of democratizing impulse of now almost anyone could express themselves in this, this uh, technology universe where everyone was equal. You had an address and every address can be accessed by anyone. Here's your web browser. I can look at your web page as easy as I look at CNM's web page. So there's this sort of exciting moment of, of people can uh, express and express themselves and expose themselves to new ideas. And, and what Facebook essentially was doing, and we sort of forget this at the time, but, but Facebook was saying, let's make this easier for people. So we're going to, we're going to build a much easier interface. You don't have to set up your own WordPress instance or learn these technologies. Uh, so we're going to build a, a, uh, an easier interface for like posting things and discovering things. And, and we forget this now, but this was critical to Facebook's rise to power is that the, the harsh thing about the early web 2.0 is that People had to confront the reality that interestingness is difficult and most people could care less what you had to say. It was easy to start a blog, but no one would read it, right? So you could go on the blogger or GeoCities and like start a blog, but if it wasn't really interesting, people would just ignore it. And Facebook solved that problem too. And he said, here's what's going to happen. You can blog about whatever through our interface. And we're going to set up a system where you friend people and we show your friends what you wrote and they can click a button that says, oh, I like that or write a little comment and you all can just trade attention to each other. And so it can be like you were running a successful early web 2.0 blog. It's easy to post stuff and crucially easy to get people to give you positive feedback. And that really was at the core of Facebook's rise. But for us early web enthusiasts, what we didn't like was they were building their own version of the internet within their own walled gardens. They said, forget HTML and HTTP, we have our own servers and everyone should just come use our private internet. And that really went contrary to the whole spirit of the internet, which is that we have these universal protocols that we all agree to use. So anyone can have a computer and plug it into any network. And now everyone can access you just as easily as anyone else. When you move to a private walled garden, it's, it's, proprietary software running on, on servers owned by Facebook, it was moving backwards. It was going from the early web back to CompuServe, going back to AOL, going back to walled gardens where one company controls how everything works. They control all the data. They control how everything shows. So a lot of early internet enthusiasts were not enthusiastic about the rise of this consolidated platform monopoly social media. It was as if we gave up on what made the internet exciting and said, why don't we just build a couple massive companies to do a cleaner, easier version of the internet? Oh, and they'll control and see everything, but don't worry about that because the interface is cool and people are clicking likes on your post. <laughs> Very interesting. I appreciate, appreciate that, uh, that description. And uh, I want to fast forward now to your your book, Deep Work, Rules for Focused Success in a Distracted World from 2016, um, and, and certainly a, a topic and a body of work that, that you are particularly known for now. Talk a bit about the definition of the deep life. And though the book was uh, written in, or at least published in 2016, talk a bit about the impact of COVID on your work. I know that um, in, in many ways, uh, the, the themes from it resonate all the more as a result of what we've experienced across the past uh, three plus years. Well, yeah, well, well, deep work, you know, when that came out in 2016, that, that represented my, my shift. This was as I was, I was a professor now, 
Uh, I wrote that book in the years leading up to tenure. Right? So I, I, I sort of got tenure right around the time that book came out. And that represented my shift towards thinking about the impact of technology on various parts of our lives. And, and that was the first book that was grappling with technology, which made sense because I was a computer scientist, whereas my early books hadn't. They were student books. Uh, and then I wrote So Good They Can't Ignore You, which was a career book in between the student books and deep work. So deep work was a sort of a pivot into me thinking about the way uh, technology affects your lives. And that was narrow. It was focusing on how technology was introducing distractions into the knowledge sector in particular, and how we were under undervaluing the impact of these distractions and then the productivity drag they were creating and the, and the countervailing opportunity for those who actually work to minimize distractions and to prioritize undistracted work. And there was this huge economic opportunity that was there. And, and, and so that was the idea, uh, you know, in that book and then uh, a world without email, which came out a couple of books later was sort of a follow-up and it was looking sort of systemically into how did we get to this point in knowledge work where we're so distracted? If it's so inefficient, why do we do it? And, and it was trying to rethink how knowledge work might be restructured. Then the pandemic hits. And it, it was interesting, the pandemic, the pandemic hit, uh, I had finished the world without email, though it hadn't come out yet. And what I found in my writing is, and I was, this was just an emergent response to my, my readers interacting with them, especially in the early months of the pandemic, was the shift away from just the narrow question of how technology intersects work and what we should do about it to this broader question of, you know, forget just making our work deeper, but what about our lives? How do we think about shaping a, a life in totality that is meaningful and remarkable and impactful in a world with these complicated forces, in a world with all these technologies that are pulling out our attention, in, in a world where we're being pushed back and forth? How do we step back and craft our lives, not just, you know, in, in, in some sense, our careers? And so the deep life emerged as a theme in my, my podcasting and writing during the early pandemic. And then it has stuck with my work ever since. And, you know, my podcast, it's one of the major themes we keep coming back towards. I'm writing a book about it. Uh, it is, it became unexpected. It was another one of these unexpected pivot points in my career is, is a little bit more philosophical, a little bit less connected to technology, but it, it just was really in the air. And I think the, the pandemic clarified that as an urge that people had to systematically deepen their lives. They, they realized during the pandemic, this is something I actually care about. I want to think about, and I want to, want to learn about. And, and so it's definitely been occupying me recently. Yeah, very, very interesting. I, 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 as you were drawing inspiration for that, who were some of the authors or thinkers that were influential to you? That's a, such an interesting topic, as you point out, a pivot for you, one that's been very successful. But, but uh, at the time, I, I have to imagine it felt like a, a, a great departure, which it certainly was. Um, who, whose works were, were influential for you as you were going through that journey? Well, I, what I found influential was encountering stories of lives that were resonating and then trying to understand why is this resonating? And that, that's the basic question that, that unlocked the deep life as a topic of pursuit is why, why do certain life stories that you encounter resonate you, with you at a deep level? What part of that is resonating? How can you capture that? So for me, because of my career, it was really the lives of various authors. And in particular, I was really resonating hearing about various authors uh, who had simplified their lives, had built their life around craft, but also counterbalance to the craft. Um, I, I'd been very influenced by, for example, Bill McKibben's story, him leaving his sort of editorial position at the New Yorker to move to a, a cabin in the Adirondacks, live cheaply and, and write books about nature. Uh, John Grisham, that story resonated with me, the way that he he sort of built his writing life around, I want to just do one book a year, and it takes me six months out of the year, and I'm off the public radar the other six months, and I'm, and I'm working on other things, and I, I want to, you know, I, I could go the Michael Crichton route and work on 50 projects at once, and I'm producing a television show and writing movies and doing three things and, and have production companies, and, and he built the life of uh, almost a monastic solitude and community. And that was very interesting to me. I, I began to collect stories of authors who had second homes and they would spend one half of the year in a city and the other half in these more 
meditative locations. I'm, you know, I'm thinking about Simon Winchester and his farm in Sandefield, Massachusetts, or Sebastian Younger with his 19th century house in the middle of the scrub pine forest in Truro, Cape Cod. And they would retreat to these places and just think and ride in the slowness. And that really resonated for me. When I deconstructed that, I, I, I learned a lot about what I value and how I want to shape my life. And, and I realized that's the process that people need to do. And they're going to look at different stories and they're going to come out with different answers. But starting with that resonant, that intimation, there's something here that appeals to me and trying to isolate that and then use that as a plan to sort of build a plan for your life. It just came out of, I was doing that early pandemic and realizing what I was doing is generalizable to many other people, even if the specifics they uncover are going to look different. Yeah. Very interesting. You, you briefly mentioned their values. And I know that you, you have spent considerable time defining your own values and counsel others to do the same to tie um, to what what you choose to work on, that there'd be kind of a grander plan, a grander set of values, uh, um, objectives in mind, uh, in order to help focus you on those things that are going to be most important. Can you talk a bit about that process and the extent to which you can share some of some of those values of yours? Well, the, the framework I think about is yeah, you, you start with values, the things that are uh, important in your life. I structure mine around roles which is the way I do it now. So in my role as a father, my role as a man, my role as a sort of thinker writer, my role as a community member. So I, I, I think of it in roles now, and that, that's actually an idea I stole from Stephen Covey. Um, and then in each role, I, I have a sort of a vignette about you know what I want my life to be like in that role. Like, well, how do I imagine my life as a, as a, as a father and, and husband? Um, a paragraph. You know, I am someone who X, Y, and Zs in these situation I Z, right? So it's it's pros and uh, embedded in there is values, which is different than I used to have at bullet point. You know, okay, this is important. This is important. Here's three sub bullet points. I found role-based narrative descriptions was more evocative. And of course we know this, right? If we think about religious traditions, how do they actually capture values? It's, it's, it's through mythology, it's through story because we we resonate with that more. Um, so I have my values document. And, and so those are, if I'm thinking of the roles properly, uh, the man as a, a father, husband, as like a thinker, thinker, professional, um, and as a community member, I think those are the main roles. And I have a sort of a, a expository paragraph for each that sort of captures how I envision living up to the, some notion of values in each of those roles. I think that becomes a, a foundation for the deep life in two different ways at two different scales. So at the short scale, of course, having clarity about your values means just as you're navigating through the, the, the moments of life, you have this foundation on which to actually steer yourself. And I think that's traditionally how we think about applying values, like a compass that's aiming you on your journey. And I think that's really valuable. So I'm in a particular situation now that's troubling or difficult or challenging. And I can lean back on my values to figure out how should I get through it? I face a big decision all of a sudden in the moment and my values help me make that decision. But I also think values can play a role at a larger, a larger scope. And this is a lot of the framework I've been developing is that you, you can also use your values uh, as well as just in general, your encounters with stories that resonate to create a vision of your ideal lifestyle and you really want to fix some sort of concrete image of a ideal lifestyle with all sorts of different elements in it, the, the, the nature of where you live and the pacing and the, the, the work, but also like the way the work interacts with other parts of your life and how you're spending your day. And you have imagery in it. You want to be very strong and, and an image that really resonates. And what I've been preaching is then you then use that values driven lifestyle vision to help build your plan for how you design all the different areas of your life. And you say, okay, I want to move towards that. So if I break my life up into like the different buckets that are important, the, the, you know, the professional bucket, the sort of health bucket, the connection community bucket, um, what am I doing in each of these areas to move me closer towards that vision? And it then becomes a, an incredibly useful tool for building systematic plans and, and, you know, how, what am I going to do with my work and where I live and, and how I, how I'm going to get there. And if I could move from this job to that job, I'd have the autonomy to move over here. And this is going to allow me to do more of this. And I can spend the whole mornings, you know, rowing on the river. And you begin to create these relatively complex plans that take into account these different areas of your life and are sort of unfolding. And it pushes you towards this ideal vision. And this ideal vision is built on values. And, and so I think that's, that's the piece that a lot of people were missing in the pandemic is uh, once I know what I'm all about, 
how do I use that to actually radically reshape my life systematically, but radically reshape my life? And that's a lot of what I've been thinking about now is, is how to much more systematically and in a focused fashion, begin moving your life towards something that resonates. And, and, you know, I think what most people fall back to instead is either say this is impossible or make a single radical change and just hope the radicalness of that change is going to make everything else better. I'm going to quit my job and move to an island. And just the radicalness of that is going to make everything else better, but it doesn't because what they're not doing is systematically moving, looking at all the different elements of their lives in a fully detailed vision and saying, how do I best get to all aspects of that vision? How do I, how do I make these changes? So I'm I'm very interested in this sort of systemization of the radical reformation of someone's life. And it's interesting. I, 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 I can see the application of this in your own life and the great fortune you've had of building the puzzle pieces in a way where it ca- causes you to have great liberty. Um, you know, you are on a pathway towards tenure, ten, being a tenured professor at Georgetown. I can only imagine that at times your thinker professional role and your father husband might be in conflict a little bit as you're doing the work that provides you that opportunity. Once that box is ticked, you have greater levels of liberty. Likewise, becoming known as an author is, is an arduous process. Granted, one you began as a 20-year-old, not one uh, where you were already a husband and father. Uh, but getting to the point where you had the sort of notoriety and income to allow you to turn down during the summer what typically professors do in getting research grants to supplement the decrease in income that naturally happens in the summers gives you great liberty to spend time as you wish uh, more so than the average professor during the summertime. So you've got a rhythm such that you've got this light at the end of the tunnel, my, my word's not yours, uh, that comes, it must be, uh, it must have just arrived, in fact, as we're talking uh, at the conclusion of Georgetown's uh, most recent semester, that there are puzzle pieces when you're, you're young or up and coming that one needs to put in place that might have you out of balance relative to some of what you described to be able to eventually take advantage of, of uh, puzzle pieces well laid. Is that, is that a fair, a fair uh, way to typify that? Well, I, I've been, I'm always thinking, always thinking for the lifestyle centric career planning angle and, and my, my ideal lifestyle shifts and the details shift and the strategy shift, but I'm, I'm, I'm always intentional. That goes all the way back to when I was still in college. So even me going to graduate school, was a result of lifestyle centric career plan. I had a job offer from Microsoft to go. Uh, it was this program that Paul Allen had created where you would, uh, they'd send you to business school at Northwestern. And while you're working at Microsoft there, they, they realized it was easier to teach engineers how to be uh, managers than it was to teach managers how to be engineers. And it was this like elite program. They're th- offering a lot of money. And I remember even back then say, no, 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 I'm thinking through my ideal lifestyle graduate school is going to give me way more flexibility, way more autonomy, way more time affluence. And it's going to allow me to sort of figure out this writing piece of my life. How am I going to write books as a, you know, a, a second year associate at Microsoft? It's not going to work, but at grad school, I have all this freedom. I was like, well, I want how much money. Um, I, I think the starting stipend got at MIT for an RA ship was, I don't know, $18,000 a year or something. Right. Uh, it's like, but I could figure that out. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm my book advances and other things, and like I'll figure that out. Uh, and it was a very so even at the very beginning, was strategic strategic decisions. Uh, the program I took a professorship in was growing and new and had a lot more flexibility. An institution that would uh, that I knew down the line would respect the other types of writing I was doing because Georgetown is a, is a liberal arts institution that really thinks about having a positive impact on the whole world. That was very intentional. There's a big difference in the options going to Georgetown versus going to a large state program. It was a dean of engineering and all they care about is, you know, funding and and publication. So all this was super, it's always intentional and you don't always get it right. And your vision changes radically as you go along, but you're absolutely right that my, everything I'm doing in my career and I'm making all sorts of shifts now, it's always updating my vision of the ideal lifestyle and then getting super strategic. Well, what am I doing this year to set up next year, which is going to maybe open up these three options. And a lot of times an option will open up to me and people say, well, that's great. I wish I had that like that. That's fantastic. That worked out for you. And what's not revealed is like, I've spent three years trying to set that option into play. I I started working on this. I didn't push it. And I put this option in here and then I shifted this here. It's a lot of puzzle pieces. I sometimes think about as chess pieces moving around uh, and I'm constantly doing that. I'm constantly shaping intentionally the forward trajectory of my career. Yeah, very interesting. And this this calls to mind a, a theme that that 
it, it runs across your work, which is use a longer time horizon that you, you highlight that from a productivity perspective, um, oftentimes people's plans are too short term in nature. And as a result of that, they don't have that kind of grander plan in place that allows them to determine whether or not they, the, 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 in some ways, the biggest outcomes are, are you're making progress towards those, however they might be defined individual by individual. Talk a bit about the, the way in which you think about going from long-term plans to quarterly to weekly plans, the way in which you kind of structure and suggest others structure in order to, to achieve some of those bigger, bigger goals. Well, you know, I'm a big believer in this concept I call slow productivity. And, and one of the key concepts of slow productivity is uh, you can accrue really impressive and high impact accomplishments over really long periods of time. And, and in the moment, we think, oh, I got to do everything right away. But in the long term, people sort of forget the time frames. And by stretching things out, slow but steady approach to accomplishment, in the long term, you can actually end up having, having great impact uh, in a way that is sustainable, in a way without burning yourself out. And that's been at the core of what I do. People tend to do what I call schedule collapse when they see multifaceted accomplishment, uh, tenure, these academic papers, these books, the New Yorker they collapse it all. And imagine how could I do all five of those things right now this week? And they would say, well, where could I possibly get the time? But the time frames on which these things actually unfold is over the years, not weeks. And it, it, it you know, okay, I'm this book over two years, I'm writing this book and it's in the background rhythm of my life. In some periods it's less in other periods I'm doing it more, but over time the book gets finished. I'm not writing six hours a day, trying to, trying to get the book done. Uh, you just, papers, like always working on an academic paper, but at a stately pace, but also don't, you know, be careful in how you choose them. And when you finish one kind of work on the other, and you're never spending a lot of hours on it, but like, it's always, you're working on it. That adds up to a lot of papers over time. So I've been a big believer in that. I've sort of made a bet early on that I would do well in situations that were highly autonomous. Uh, so how you actually did the work was really up to you, um, but highly accountable. So we don't care how or when you're doing this the quality of the results are going to make all the difference, right? That's grad school. That's academia. You know, what, what is the tenure process? If not welcome to our university, we'll check back in, in five years. If you've done something great, you can stay. If you haven't, you lose your job and that's it. You know, it's that slow productivity, you know, at its, at its most distilled, it's highly accountable, highly autonomous. And I, I figured I can thrive in that setting. Give me flexibility to figure out when and how, and what I work on and give me some time, I can produce something, something cool. So a lot of what I did, the reason I, the way I could have two careers writing in academia before they merged more recently is I just slowed things down slow, but steady. I'm working on this. Now I'm working on that. I didn't want any one day to be stressful, but slow, but steady, if it's aimed properly really can add up a lot. And even though some of the stuff took me a long time to do in retrospect, it's oh seven books. You must be writing all the time. I can't imagine, but it's like, well, that is seven books. But I started when I was 20. And it's just sort of in the background of my life with whole years where I'm doing nothing. And then a year where it's, not, and it's all slowing down, taking your time. It's the quality of the results that ultimately matter. No one remembers how long it took. And if you lean into that, a lot of accomplishment becomes a lot more sustainable. I want to talk about uh, your book from, I believe it was 2019, Digital Minimalism, Choosing a Focused Life in a Noisy World. Uh, one of the key elements that's discussed there is the 30-day declutter. It's sort of a core philosophy of the digital minimalism. Uh, I, I found it fascinating to learn more about the genesis of that, that an idea of yours, you, you uh, put out through your newsletter, the desire to have people join you on this journey so that uh, you might be able to profile them, hoping that maybe, I think you said six or seven uh, might say yes, so that uh, you could then follow them on the journey. I think, it, I think you said it was 15 or 1600 <laughs> said yes to it. And obviously, uh, it is, is uh, a great number of lessons that came from that. Talk a bit about that project, if you would, and some of the key learnings that you've gotten from it, uh, both through your own experience, but very importantly from others uh, who you've been in touch with as they've done the same. I mean, the, the core insight behind the, the clutter idea is that the, the optimal approach to technology, especially in our personal lives, is additive instead of subtractive. So we, we had developed this mindset starting around 2017. This is when we got a more general 
well-spread unease with personal consumer technology, especially phones and social media. Uh, I had long been skeptical of these technologies. Uh, it really wasn't until 2017 that that became more widespread. That's what motivated me to write that book. And what I noticed was we were taking a reductive or subtractive approach to this unease. So focus on something we think in our life digitally that is bad and take it out. Ah, I'm on Instagram too much. I think I, I, I'm on all the time. I want to stop using Instagram. And I thought studying this and talking to people that actually the additive philosophy was better. You start with a fully coherent philosophy of your life and how technology fits into it. And then you carefully choose technology to add that fits this vision. So, so adding technologies for a reason was going to be more sustainable than trying to remove technologies for a reason. And so how do we do this? I said, we kind of have to start from scratch. I, I, I I didn't actually take inspiration from Mary Kondo because I didn't know who that was, but it was later pointed out to me that this is how Mary Kondo handles physical clutter. She said, look, you don't go into your closet that's stressfully overcrowded and start looking for things that you don't need. Like, well, I don't really need this. Let me, let me get rid of that. She says, no, no, you empty the whole thing. And then you look at what's there and say, well, what really deserves to go back in the closet? And that's what the declutter was. That's why I used declutter, not detox. This is primarily not about the physio getting physiologically comfortable without using these tools. So that was certainly a part of it. I was thinking more of this physical decluttering metaphor of step away from all these technologies for 30 days. It's like emptying your closet so that you can restart and say, okay, I'm going to add things back from scratch. What do I need in my life, digitally speaking, to achieve my goals? That was the whole notion of the declutter. And so, yes, I put out this call to my newsletter saying, I want to follow some people doing this because I want to write about it in my book. And I thought it would be six people and I would call them. And it was 1,600 people, uh, including, interestingly enough, a roommate of a New York Times reporter. So, you know, I'm trying to do this under the radar for a book I'm writing. And my publisher is calling me and saying, why is the New York Times writing an article about digital minimalism? The book doesn't come out for another year. Like, you were supposed to keep the secrets. Like, I, the reporter did the declutter. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it wasn't, wasn't my fault. And But what I learned from that is that uh, it validated my hypothesis. The people who tried to white knuckle reduce their technology use, like, ah, this is bad. I don't want to use it. And just, I'm just not going to use it. It wasn't sustainable. And the people who instead started from scratch to build a positive vision of their life and have technology specifically added to be part of that vision, they were much more likely to have sustainable changes. And this was not surprising. It's what we know from the substance abuse community that it's very difficult to say, I'm going to stop smoking just because uh, smoking's bad and I should do less smoking. The, it's much easier if you have a positive vision of your life that doesn't include smoking. Pregnant women do not have a hard time quitting smoking, uh, have a much easier time because why are they quitting smoking? Because of this positive vision they have of the health of their child and you know wanting to give them all these opportunities. So focusing on the positive, that is always much more powerful than just saying, here's the negative thing I want to avoid. Because what would happen is they'd say, well, Instagram's not that bad and I'm bored and is it really going to kill me to look at it this time? And they'd go back to it. And so, yeah, the declutter was at the core of my, my additive philosophy of technology use. Add in tech for a reason. Don't just default use everything and remove it once it crosses some threshold of being interminably bad. I must say, I, I, I often read your work with the lens of being a father and, and the guidance one might give to their children along the way based upon what you've described. Um, actually, a friend, Art Hu, uh, um, had a question for you, submitted a question for you. Uh, and, and I'll read it here. A lot of your work is about how children can focus and excel, but focus makes assumptions about knowing what to focus on, something children in high school or even college may not really know. What advice would you give kids as they think about a future where the path to success seem both narrow and quickly changing and where the relationship with educational outcomes and real world outcomes outside of academia aren't always clear? I would say think about focus like a superpower that your peers are bad at it and they're, they're getting increasingly bad. And by focus, I mean the ability to actually train your concentration on a particular goal and sustain it, making full use of existing structures of information that you've already learned and trying to augment those structures, to produce new, new intelligence. It's a trainable activity. It's like running. It is not crazy to imagine yourself being able to run a seven minute, 30 second mile. You could be like, yeah, I could do that. I would have, it'd probably take me you know, a year of training, I'd have to do a bunch of running, but it's not crazy. Uh, I can't do it now, but if I trained, I could do it. And that's actually the right way to think about focus. If you're not working on it, you're probably bad at it, but you could get pretty good at it. 
And it's, it's like being in a world of there's a bunch of, you know, 5k fun runs and no one else is training. Give yourself a couple of years. You're going to get a lot of gold medals, right? Because you don't have to run a five minute mile. You just have to do better than people who aren't training at all. And so this is what I actually would tell young people is that this is a superpower. So you've got to treat your concentration and your mind like an athlete would treat their body. I mean, very wary about, let's say, exposing it to excessive digital junk food, which would be uh, algorithmically curated distraction at, at, at any moment. Be very worried if you are looking at a phone at all times. This is like you're smoking as a professional basketball player. You're not going to make it half court for four quarters, you know, if you keep doing that. And so I've really been emphasizing this to young people is this could be a huge competitive advantage that will apply to wherever the industries of tomorrow have shifted towards. You don't need to know exactly what's going to be valued because focus is going to be an amplifier for all of it. And you should be training your brain to be comfortable with concentration and big ideas, treating your brain with respect. So few young people are doing it that you are going to be, you know, you will look like uh, the professional sprinter in a world of out of shape people if we want to follow that metaphor. Um, so it, it's a huge opportunity right now if you're young. It's societal, it's a problem that we are devaluing focus and our sort of techno attention culture is making it worse. For an individual, it's an opportunity. You don't have to outrun the bear, you just have to outrun your friends when the bear tries to attack. So there, there is a sort of a short-term opportunity for young people. And I preach that to them all the time. I'm like, man, it's such a superpower. Treat your brain with respect. You're going to run circles around people. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to ask you also about the application of your ideas to leaders of companies. A lot of people who, who are reading, who are uh, excuse, rather listening and, and watching this are, are just that. And thinking about the application to, you know, tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people uh, for people of influence. I, I know you, 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 although you're not part of a business, a, a, a big business yourself, you advise people and speak with people who, who are. How have you seen these ideas uh, applied in those sort of settings particularly well? I think the, the issue if you're a knowledge work leader in particular is we do not have a coherent understanding of productivity in this sector. And, and recognizing that I think is critical if you want to unlock some real competitive advantages. Agriculture, we know what productivity means. When I tilt my field this way, the bushels per acre goes up. Industrial manufacturing, we know what productivity means. When I switch from the craft method to the continuous motion assembly line, I can exactly measure the number of paid man hours required to produce each Model T. It went down by a factor of 10. That's great. When we're at desks and office buildings, we do not have a nearly as quantitative or coherent of a definition of productivity. And this has created endless problems ever since. We use the word loosely. We use the word often in you'll excuse the irony here, counterproductive ways. And so I think a lot of what happens then is when leaders think about productivity, if we take the, the sort of full pipeline of knowledge work where information comes in and information with new value comes out, we put all of our attention on the margins, the uh, acquisition of relevant information, the, the moving of information back and forth between people, the speed with which we can then take new thoughts and put it into like a nice PowerPoint or this or that. And in our haste to make the margins more productive, so to be more efficient, the way we, we identify and move around information and, and talk to each other, we end up actually making the real bottleneck, the thing that actually matters, which is the cogitation, the thinking, the, the using of human thought to produce new value, we make that worse and worse. So we say, great, we've made it super easy for me to get information from you. I can just send an email and it takes me seven seconds and and our culture here is that you have you, you have to respond to that right away. My God, that's so efficient. But what we don't realize is because now I have to tend that inbox, it takes me seven times longer to actually think and produce real valuable things. And net net, we end up worse off. I, I just saw a chart of total factor productivity broken up by Epic. And what do we see as we go from 2005 to the present? The era of mobile computing, the era of ubiquitous email, the era of uh, laptops and smartphones and access to the world's information anywhere at any time. I can communicate to you from the above the Rocky Mountains and my, my United 737 from a satellite. And we, all of these things, total factor productivity, as small as it's ever been. And it's because we don't know what productivity means. So we look at the visible, tractable things, technological, technology supported uh information, identification, exchange, and analysis at the margins of real knowledge work. And we're like, let's make that as fast as possible. And we made the real bottleneck, which is human thinking, 
less and less effective. And so this is sort of my plea. This is uh, at the core of my book, A World Without Emails. My plea for leaders is we have to rethink how we structure collaboration and work. We have to stop listening to the tech companies that want everything to be about how efficiently we can identify and process information and say, you're not who we need. We need to think about human brains that are actually thinking and how do we set up work and collaboration to let people do the thinking. That is ultimately the mill that grinds the proverbial information wheat into actual millable flour, right? That is the ultimate thing in knowledge work that produces the value. It's not just how quick can we get the wheat to the mill. It's not just how quick can we load the wheat, wheat into the wagon. It's how well and how long does it take us in the end to actually take the 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 weed and the seed and, and, and get the flower out at the other end? And so that's my plea is rethink what matters in knowledge work and think about how we can structure knowledge work to, to actually prioritize and protect the most important aspects, which for most people is thinking, undistracted, non-context switching cogitation. Good advice, certainly. Uh, in April, you wrote a piece for The New Yorker called What Kind of Mind Does ChatGPT Have? And I, I wanted to ask you to share some of your conclusions and your thoughts more general, generally on generative AI. I think that the key thing about generative AI is we are not ready yet to have confident conclusions about what it's going to do. And there are, I think, way too many confident projections or predictions that people are putting out there and treating as fact and then reacting to, then right now our current understanding or examples with this technology would justify. I think what's happening here is unlike other technological revolutions, because the interface to this technology is linguistic, everyone feels a, uh, a kinship or affinity or understanding to what's going on here because we're used to interacting linguistically with other beings. So what happens is we see these linguistic interactions, these, these screenshots of successful interactions with ChatGPT. And then we imagine what type of mind would be able to talk like that? And we, we, we typically are using sort of human analogies. And we say, well, if I had a mind like that, but like trapped in a box that I could command, what else could that thing do? Oh my God, I could do all this other work. Oh my God, my industry is going to go away. So we invent minds hypothetically, and then we do a thought experiment about what this hypothetical mind could do. And then we get really worried. We treat that like a coming fact, and then we get really worried about that. And I think we're really jumping ahead here of the actual technologies. And again, it's because it's linguistic. If this was doing... Uh, a more advanced mathematical analysis that was incredibly potentially disruptive and useful, people would be more, okay, let's wait to see what this is. But we all understand linguistics. We all understand text. We all under, we chat on our phone all day. This sounds a lot like people we chat with on our phone. My God, what's going on here? So, so I think we're a little bit ahead of where our understanding of the actual technology. And so what I did in that New Yorker piece was, let me just explain how this works. Without trying to make a lot of analysis, Let's just explain how what what actually is happening in a large language model like GPT 35, which is what's underneath uh, the original chat GPT. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I think it's more restrictive than people realize. I don't know that people realize it's a feed forward token guesser. Text goes into it and its entire modus operandi is to say, what is the what is a good next word to add to this? That's not even the next word. What's a good next token? A typical word might be made up by multiple tokens, but let's just think word. That's what it does. Now, it does a lot of uh, advanced neural net based pattern recognition of the text to help solve that game well. It, it's what allows it to see, oh, over here, I, this looks like a question. And it looks like it's a question that has to do with uh, asking for a sitcom script. And over here, here's a text that we've just outputted the last 20 words, they match this pattern we have for a sitcom joke. So when we're trying to figure out what word to output next, we want a word that not only makes sense giving these most recent words, but a word that uh, would show up in this context in other sitcom scripts we've seen when we were trained. So it's not just gonna be grammatically correct, but also leaning towards what we'd see in a script. And that's what it does. It generates guesses for next words based on text that it's seen so far. This exact same model, uh, you expand your, your response by a word and you put this new response in the model without any changes to the model and it spits out guesses for the next word. Uh, and that's what it does. And, it, and to do so, it has amazing what's known as formal linguistic competence. It really has embedded in its neural next the structure of the English language really well, better than linguists thought might be possible. But it's also a different picture than let's say a, a general purpose human brain and the multiple different linguistic and non-linguistic elements that all work together and collaborate to try to generate understanding of the world. It's a much more specific thing these models are doing, which is all to say, 
we don't know what the full capability of that really powerful but narrow skill set is. And we need to kind of, we're, we're, we're sort of waiting to see what it is, but it's not structured like a human brain. It's focused on understanding of the structure of English language. How much can we tack on to that? How much useful tools can we build on top of that? And the answer is we don't know yet. And it is a big open question. But we are uh, the mistake to make is to think that this this these really competent, nuanced linguistic responses are corresponding to a sort of human style multi center cogitation. It's a much more narrow thing. And so I I my argument here is we need to kind of take things slowly, and by slowly I mean work more off of example than speculation. Oh look, okay, this company just fired this division and they've replaced them with, okay, now we've learned something about what it actually can do in this context. And, oh, now we can think about that and be worried about it or not worried about it. And I've been, I've been arguing with generative AI, we need to shift the valence of critique right now away from speculation and a little bit more of analysis of actual things that are happening because the speculation is too wild and it's too difficult and everyone can do it. And it's too hard to figure out what's reasonable or not. So I'm, I think we don't know yet, not, not to do a long rant here. We don't know yet what you're going to be able to build off of this formal linguistic competence. We'll discover it. A lot of people are trying things. And so we'll see what actually works or what doesn't, but we don't know exactly what the scope of that impact is going to be yet. Yeah. Uh, very, very interesting. It gives us a lot of course to, to continue to monitor there as that progresses, but uh, Cal Newport, thank you for a remarkable conversation representative of your Catholicity, the variety of topics that you, you have, uh, influenced the number of areas that you are investigating and and uh writing about it's been a, a really fascinating conversation thank you so much well thanks peter i enjoyed uh diving all over the place i mean look the world of ideas is an interesting world it's a great world to explore so i had fun touching on a bunch of different things too.